The crimes committed in places like these defined an ideology. For several generations, barracks, barbed wire and piles of emaciated corpses are the images that came to define a cult of death that disguises itself as a solution to all of society's problems. The demagogues who promised alleviation of all ills in the end brought upon society the greatest of all ills and managed to invent what no ideology or tyrant has invented or created before. The industrialization of murder. A state industry dedicated to killing. And this living memory and association has throughout the decades helped keep that ideology at bay, relegated it to the toxic waste bin of ideologies as something to be shunned and condemned. It is, however, in recent years that society finds itself challenged with a resurgence of that ideology, mainly through the new medium of the internet, through which it seeks to spread in a propagandistic media form rather than through thuggish brutality on our streets. But even online, what happened in places like these stands as a stepping stone in the way of their faith. And it is because of this that you will find an increasing number of online mouthpieces and ideologues who deny the historical facts of what happened in places like this one, who belittle these facts, minimalize them, and even so blatantly or covertly call these facts into doubt, but more importantly, the association they gave to their faith into doubt. A subtle revisionism and denial, which is often masked and disguised as just another outlet of conservatism. This series, however, is not dedicated to these ideologues or their following. It is dedicated to you. I wish to take you to these places where these crimes happened and show you why what happened here matters, why it defines the ideology of those who now offer their position as an ailment to all of society's ills again, and to not merely show how they are wrong when denying what happened here, but why they deny what happened here, and why what happened here is deeply tied to their vile faith. <laughs> I want to start by visiting a place far less known than Auschwitz, Dachau or Belsen. It is a place, in fact, very close to where I live in Vienna. One merely takes the intercity train to Linz, from where one takes the regional train heading to St. Nikola Struden and gets out at the train station Mauthausen. From there, a taxi can take you for 10 euros to what used to be the Nazi death camp tucked away on top of a hill, hidden by the forest surrounding it in the hilly landscape of northern Austria bordering the Czech Republic. I came here in November 2017, shortly before I was driven off YouTube by people who didn't want me to make these videos. I could have gone to Auschwitz, Dachau, Belsen and Buchenwald first, but this place is special. Within this camp you will find something unique, something that unfortunately is not as well known as the iconic image of the gates of Auschwitz, but should be. And to find out what it is, we have to turn back time 70 years and head to a completely different country. The invasion of Poland in September 1939 marked far more than just the beginning of the Second World War in Europe. It also started off a countdown, the countdown to war between France, Britain and Germany, who as a result were destined to at one point open armed hostilities. And the clicking of that clock was closely and nervously observed by the Dutch people. The Dutch were determined to do their best to remain neutral in this war, but dreaded it nonetheless. During World War I, unrestricted German submarine warfare and the collapse of world trade resulted in some suffering and famine for the Dutch people. Even remaining neutral would bring challenges. Promises were made by the German side to respect Dutch neutrality. In case of invasion, a defensive strategy was drawn up called Fortress Holland. Dams across the Netherlands would be broken, resulting in vast swaths of Dutch land being swamped in water too shallow to maneuver boats, but deep enough to cause the land to turn into a muddy swamp that tanks couldn't pass. Meanwhile, the Dutch army would retreat and fight from the urban coastal areas, the military military strategies called Fortress Holland. However, both the Dutch government and people were hoping to remain neutral in this conflict and to not be involved on either side once armed conflict would flare up. However, hopes amongst the Dutch people were high that being dragged into this war could be avoided.
Then on the 9th of April 1940, Germany invaded Denmark and Norway without declaring war and having promised both these countries and their people that their neutrality would be respected. Denmark fell within a day, while the Norwegians put up a substantial fight lasting from April into June. Suddenly, reality started to sink in, as the Dutch realized that any promises Hitler may make to respect a nation's neutrality were worthless. Troops were put on high alert along the borders and preparations were made to implement the Fortress Holland plan. Mijn volk, nadat ons land met angstvallige nauwgezetheid al deze maanden een stipte neutraliteit had in acht genomen, is in de afgelopen nacht door de Duitse weermacht, zonder de minste waarschuwing, een plotselinge aanval op ons gebied gedaan. The invasion of the Netherlands didn't come by land, but by air, as the Dutch awoke to sounds of German planes dropping paratroopers over the Netherlands. These paratroopers secured the bridges that were meant to be blown up by the Dutch in accordance with the Fortress Holland plan to prevent a German advance over the rivers. The German army immediately followed crossing bridge after bridge held by their paratroopers. For four long days the Dutch army and air force, assisted by the Royal Air Force and French army, desperately tried to retake or destroy the bridges held by German paratroopers before the main German army could reach them. However, on the 13th of May, German troops linked up with paratroopers at the bridge crossing the Maas River into Rotterdam. The Fortress Holland plan was rendered useless and the Dutch army prepared for urban warfare in the Dutch metropolitan areas. Then, on the 14th of May, people of Rotterdam noticed engine sounds as a vast air fleet of German bombers approached the skies above their homes and unleashed a devastating, indiscriminate bombardment of the city. A short while later, an ultimatum arrived at the Dutch army headquarters by Hermann Goering. If the Dutch army shouldn't surrender, the German bomber fleet would systematically destroy every single Dutch city, indiscriminate of targets being of military strategic value or civilian homes. The Dutch army surrendered. The invasion of the Netherlands is in most history books just a brief stepping stone, over within four days of its beginning. However, this is by far not the end of the fighting Dutchman's story. The majority of the Dutch navy successfully escaped to Britain together with soldiers, pilots and one of the world's biggest merchant fleets. The government and Queen had escaped to Britain and surrender was stubbornly refused. The Free Dutch may be less famous than the Free French and the Free Polish, but still kept fighting until their homeland was free. And one of the darkest chapters of their story revolves around those who did the most risky and daring of operations one could engage in during war. After the war in Europe was lost, the war cabinet around Churchill was determined to by all means necessary keep the fight going on mainland Europe, to make the occupation of foreign lands as difficult as possible for the Germans, resulting in the creation of the Special Operations Executive, short SOE. The SOE was tasked with recruiting young men and women with exceptional fitness and intelligence, train them in guerrilla warfare and to drop them via parachute over occupied countries to organize, connect and train resistance movements and coordinate their activities with armed forces in Britain. told us almost apologetically about lethal tablets, suicide pills, to be taken only as a last resort. We made notes about organization and personal security. Learned how to recognize all ranks of the German services. Told how to use codes. How the BBC sent personal messages during the news. The organization of the Gestapo. Until our brains reeled under the load of information. Hundreds of such agents were trained and then dropped into occupied France, Belgium, Greece, Yugoslavia and the Netherlands over the course of the war. In all countries where such agents were deployed, their activities resulted in great successes for the Allies. However, the operations conducted in the Netherlands ended mainly in disaster. During what became known as the Englandspiel, or England game, the Gestapo managed to arrest the Dutch resistance contact with the British mainland. As a consequence, the Gestapo controlled the messages being sent to Britain and were the first to read all messages sent to the resistance from the SOE. Weapons dropped via parachute were immediately picked up by the Gestapo. But more crucially, almost every SOE agent dropped into the occupied Netherlands was grabbed by the Gestapo. And those arrested were tortured in the Gestapo prison and eventually in September 1944 deported to Mauthausen. There they were brought to this place, the prison barracks of the camp, where they were viciously tortured and eventually dragged into the cellar where between the 6th and 7th of September they were all shot. 
Their bodies were brought to the crematoria, where a unique act of resistance occurred. Yugoslavian and Russian prisoners who were part of the crematoria prison workers separated their bodies from the other dead and burned them separately. They then, under great risk to their own life, buried the ashes separately behind the crematoria at this wall, where today this memorial stands, dedicated to the 40 Dutch and 7 British soldiers who were murdered in this place. This place is special, it is unique in its value, not just to history, but to our understanding of the crimes that took place here. I have visited Auschwitz, Buchenwald and Dachau and have not seen another place like this one. This, to my knowledge, is the only named grave in a camp of people murdered during the Holocaust. Out of the 11 million people murdered during this crime lasting several years, it was these 40 Dutch and 7 British soldiers who during an act of resistance were given the dignity of having their own named grave. When you stand before this place and look at the poppy and tulips left by Dutch and British visitors, you realize something that I believe no other place can make you realize better. The people murdered here were not just digits within a big number, they were people lived experiences and lives. There is far more here than just the significance of an attempt of having people's dignity restored to them after their death. Their names are written here and there is a physical presence and point to start retracing their lives. Second Lieutenant Cornelis Drogliver, born on the 10th of April 1922 in Amsterdam. He was a member of the Dutch army during the German invasion and after surrender he went to study at the University of Leiden. However, upon arrival he heard of fellow young Dutch students on campus who had crossed the North Sea to Britain in a fishing boat to continue the fight for a free Netherlands with the free Dutch forces. Cornelis decided to join that fight and together with friends they boarded a train from Antwerp to Toulouse to then head to Britain through Spain and Gibraltar. On that train Cornelis kept insulting a German soldier which resulted in them almost getting arrested. Crossing the Pyrenees into Spain they were arrested by Spanish authorities and interned near Barcelona. The British embassy negotiated their release and they then travelled aboard a free Polish ship battery to Glasgow arriving on the 4th of January 1942. From there they were brought to London to receive special operations training. On the night of the 24th of September 1942, Cornelis was dropped near Drenthe by a Fokker G1 of the Free Dutch Air Force. He was immediately arrested by the Gestapo upon landing and deported to the concentration camp Mauthausen, where he spent two years in captivity before being murdered at the age of 22. Art Hendrik Albas, born on the 20th of September 1918 in Middelhanis. He finished his final exams in Dordrecht in 1936 and then signed up for the Dutch Navy Academy in Rotterdam. As a student he travelled extensively to China and Japan. After the invasion he started collecting information on German troop strength and movement and on the night of the 18th of March 1941, together with a friend, they crossed the North Sea in a boat wearing stolen German uniforms. Arriving in Britain, they handed over the gathered information for which they would later be awarded the Bronze Cross. On the night of the 5th of July 1941, he was dropped via parachute into Neuwischwanz and managed to build a substantial resistance network in Den Haag in the house of the family Hüttingen, a place at which many Dutch resistance members would organize. We know that he had a bent ear since birth and because this made him easily identifiable, fellow resistance members straightened out his ear in what must have been very painful amateur surgery with kitchen knives and knitting kits. The resistance cell in Hüttingen House in Den Haag managed to work for 11 Months. On the 15th of July 1942, the group was betrayed and many arrested by the Germans. Alblas managed to escape, however, on the 16th, he was arrested. Visited in prison by the Hüttingen family, he was offered the opportunity to escape but declined out of fear of reprisals against his family. He was deported to Mauthausen, where he was murdered on the 7th of September 1944 at the age of 25. Isidore Newman was born on the 26th of January 1916 in Leeds, England. He trained as a primary school teacher, after which he moved to Hull in 1938. After the outbreak of war, he joined the Royal Corps of Signals in August 1940 and was posted at an anti-aircraft battery in Sheffield during the Battle of Britain. In July 1941, he joined the SOE's French section and, despite not being very fluent in French, completed his training in Scotland, after which he was shipped covertly into southern France on board a Royal Navy submarine. In France, France, he spent four months observing German activities and sending reports of these back to Britain. After returning to Britain through Gibraltar, he immediately signed up for another operation in France in 1943. Going undercover with the French resistance and receiving weapons drops, he took part and contributed in the sinking of a German minesweeper. 
the wrecking of a power station, and the derailing of a German troop train. In April, he was arrested by the Gestapo in a French resistance safe house after being betrayed. He was brought to the Gestapo prison in Paris with other British and two Canadian agents for interrogation and torture, and in September deported to Mauthausen, where he was murdered. Cornelis Karel Braga was born on the 23rd of November 1913 in Amsterdam. After graduating from nautical college, he found work in the Dutch steam shipping line as a helmsman. He made several voyages to India, however decided to find work on land when he got engaged to his wife Ada in 1935. Finding work as a radio operator for Radio Schwenningen and later with the Batavian Import Company in Vlaardringen. Alongside, he would also teach at the School for Inland Shipping in Rotterdam. In 1939, he was called up for service in the Dutch Navy, and during the German invasion, the ship he was on managed to escape to Britain. Receiving training for intelligence work, he was dropped into the Netherlands on the 16th of February 1943, and was immediately arrested by the Gestapo upon landing. He managed to smuggle out a letter to his wife Ada, meant to be smuggled back to Britain, warning that the Germans knew they were coming, and that intelligence in the Netherlands had been compromised. He was deported to Mauthausen on the 5th of September 1944, where he was murdered the next day, barely 31 years old. What all these 47 men have in common is that they are buried here and that they are celebrated as national heroes in the Netherlands and in France. Because of that, their stories are easily accessible, their archives are open and anyone is welcome to read through the documents that tell their story. These documents give you not only an insight into the fact that these people existed, they give you an insight into how historians work. The people who deny what happened here often proclaim that what is written in the history books, such as the number of people murdered here, is mere speculation. Facts, such as the number of victims of the Holocaust, are not just conjured up, though, through speculation. Historians work through representing with hard evidence what they write into the history books. A historian is in essence an archiver who collects the evidence for events that happened in the past and preserves them for mankind's collective memory. The number of people murdered here is not based on speculation, but on evidence of the victim's existence, name by name by name, life story after life story. But more than that, this memorial plaque and grave, together with the documents telling you the story of these people, should tell you something else. These people who were murdered here were meant to disappear from our collective memory. The Nazis intended for us to never hear of them. From the moment a person stepped into this place, they were meant to be unpersoned. First for being reduced to a number, and then being robbed of their identity, and then by being reduced to nothing but a pile of ash to be blown away with the wind. And it is very difficult to make a human being disappear. Think of it. Who are you? What would happen if the next day you were picked up and disappeared into some nameless mass grave? What remains are the lived experiences that impacted others, the memories of your existence amongst your loved ones, friends, co-workers, and those who knew you. The documents showing when you were born, where you went to school, where you worked at, where you studied at, where you were arrested, who you were married to, who your children are, the countless pictures that exist of you. A person that disappears leaves a trace in other people's lives, and using those traces to to restore the life of a story of a human being is how historians have worked out who and how many were murdered in places like these. But far more important than that, gathering the stories of their lives is to restore a part of their dignity, to give back a face and a name to those who had it brutally torn away from them. When the people who deny what happened in places like these serenade and preach over what they call inconsistent numbers or inaccurate numbers or mere speculation, I guarantee you that not a single person amongst them has ever done what historians do and what I also did in November 2017. Go to the archives of one of these places to see for yourself the effort and work being conducted by historians to determine and archive what happened here, to read through documents, to retrace a human being's life. Historians don't speculate, they collect and archive. They provide solid proof of the facts that they write into the history books by searching, tracing back and archiving the documents, pictures and family testimony that provides the evidence that a dead man was once alive. And within the archives you will find many a name and face belonging to a human being that was meant to be disappeared and forgotten. And it is the intention of those who deny what happened here to have their existences denied and forgotten because these people are the evidence of the crimes committed by their ideology. 
Within the memorial grounds, there's a wall called the Wailing Wall, upon which plaques have been fixed to commemorate the dead by countries and organizations who had their people murdered here. Poles, Romanians, Greeks, Bulgarians, Norwegians, Austrians, Albanians, Azerbaijanis, Croatians, Belarusians, Kazakhstanis, Lithuanians, Bosnians, Montenegrins, homosexuals, Boy Scouts, Polish Boy Scouts, Roma, Haganah members, pacifists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and some that may surprise you, such as Spaniards, Americans, Swiss, Portuguese, Chinese, Turks, and Cubans. Countries and organizations whose people were murdered here are invited to build memorials in this place and to fix a plaque. The plaque dedicated to the Chinese victims was only recently added by the Chinese ambassador to Austria after historians identified the Chinese victims of this camp. Beyond the individual task of restoring a person's dignity by restoring the memories of those who were intended to be forcefully removed from history, these memorials serve the purpose of reminding us of the national traumas suffered by nations and societies. The memorial to the Czech people murdered here stands close to the entrance, reminding us that this place, which lies so close to the Czech border, is the final resting place of many Czechs. People such as Aldrich Pechel, a professional soldier from the small town of Rezovich. After Czechia was annexed by Nazi Germany, he together with fellow Czech soldiers left their homeland and went to France to fight with the French Foreign Legion against the Germans and for a free Czechia. During the Battle of France, he was evacuated to Britain, where he joined the British Army and was recruited from there to the SOE Czech section. Mistakenly dropped into Slovakia by parachute, he made his way across the border into Czechia, where he was grabbed by the Gestapo in a trap set by Gestapo men pretending to be resistance members. During his arrest, he managed to free himself of his handcuffs twice and seriously injure a Gestapo officer. Following his arrest, he was brutally tortured, but refused to give away any other resistance members or Czech paratroopers dropped in together with him, even when he was forced to watch the execution of his parents and younger brothers. He was deported to Mauthausen, where he was hanged on the 22nd of November 1942. He was awarded the highest military order of his country after death and is considered a national hero in the Czech Republic to this day. Many other members of the Czech resistance and those who had fought for a free Czechia were murdered here. The grain mill worker Bratislav Bauman and his wife Emily, who had helped free Czech paratroopers by hiding them and helping them smuggle weapons dropped by the British into Prague, both refused to give up any Czech resistance members to the Gestapo and were deported to Mauthausen where they were murdered. But also those who had resisted Nazi occupation in a less direct way, such as Karel Hašla, considered a national treasure in Czechia, a songwriter, actor, comedian, movie director, playwright and theatre owner in Prague, who rose to fame through patriotic works demanding independence from Austria, directing many movies and writing and performing songs, and being an influential artist during his time, he opposed the Nazi German annexation of Czechia publicly with plays, songs and movies, for which he was arrested, deported to Mauthausen, where he was so savagely beaten by the guards that he died of his injuries. His works are still performed in the Czech Republic to this day, where he is still celebrated as a national treasure. About an hour's train ride from where I live is the Czech city of Brinn, known for being the birthplace of the mathematician and friend of Einstein Kurt Gödel. Brinn is home to the second largest university in the Czech Republic, Masaryk University. When the Nazis annexed Czechia, all Czech universities were shut down by the occupiers. And in this place, the professors and deans had almost universally opposed the German occupation from the start, both privately and publicly. People like František Kolacek, professor for geography, head of the geography department, member of the Royal Bohemian Society of Sciences, with 99 publications to his name. Jan Florian, professor for medicine at Masaryk University and the world-renowned scientist and expert in the fields of histiology and embryology, who had worked as a professor in universities in Bratislava and London before returning to Brünn, throughout his career publishing 33 scientific works. Karel Horra, Professor for Anatomy, Chairman of the Scientific and Medical Committee of the Physical Education Advisory Council at the Ministry of Public Health, with 22 scientific works to his name. Antonin Simek, Professor and Director of the Institute of Theoretical Physical Chemistry at the Faculty of Science of Masaryk University. These four men were all murdered here for opposing the Nazi occupation of their homeland. But these are only a handful of Czech academics murdered during the Nazi purge of Czech academia, a reminder that besides being robbed of its sovereignty, freedom and resources, the Nazis also robbed the Czechs of some of their brightest minds. 
We also know the identities of those murdered here from Germany and Austria for having been deemed as undesirable and degenerates who were to be exterminated from society, giving us an insight into who was deemed unworthy of life in the dreadful utopia the Nazis had envisaged. Fritz Bockius, lawyer and member of the German parliament representing the 33rd district of Hesse for the Centre Party, arrested and deported in 1944 during a Nazi campaign to arrest all who used to be members of parties opposed to the Nazis. Liddy Barkov, a trans woman from Hamburg, imprisoned for homosexuality and judged to be a degenerate of social norms, therefore deported to and murdered in Mauthausen. Franz Erhard from Baden-Württemberg, whose crime it was to write into a diary what he truly thought of the Nazi regime. His diary was given to the Gestapo and he was arrested and deported to Mauthausen. Karl Ruppich from Salzburg, a father of four and pacifist who refused to join the army and hid in the mountains. Captured by the Gestapo, he was deported to Mauthausen and murdered. Otto Popper, a Viennese Jew. Marcel Lee, a Catholic priest. Eugen Prötzl, a metal worker. In case you have not realized it yet, the identities of the people murdered here and in many other places like this are not a mystery, neither are they speculated over. In fact, they are the foundation upon which the facts written about the events surrounding their murders were written upon. The numbers of victims are not just assumed and certainly not made up. They are the result of decades of research by dedicated historians, driven by an academic and humanistic ideal to document and archive the truth, which drives all historians. But far more importantly, we do not remember them and their names because we are part of a conspiracy to deceive you, as some may accuse, or to hold you down, or to hold down an ideology, or to exaggerate, or to guilt you, or to lie to you. No, we remember their names to restore part of their dignity that was torn from them. We remember because it is the right thing to do. We remember because their blood is on the hands of the very ideology whose adherents deny that these crimes happened. And their names, lives, beliefs, convictions and deaths will play an important role as this video series continues. What do you see here? This are the names of all the people we know who were murdered here. And it's nothing but a giant room. Names. And you have one, two, three catalogues. And all of the names of people murdered him. <laughs> 